I can launch the missiles. They're all written like that. They're written with these really vague, any, you know, any use can be potentially illegal. And it's, it scares me. It should scare you guys. Um, I'm going to give some lessons. And the biggest rule I want to say is it's really hard to tell the criminals, the people we want to stop. We want to hold them aside and say they're bad. And people that do, well, what we do. You know, if you're, if you're, research, if you're researching security, if you are uh, helping, you know, helping your, your corporate clients. Um, and I, I decided to be a little cheesy. So it's really hard to tell the criminals apart from the good guys. So we have a freelance security researcher. Now, evil computer criminal. Can anyone tell the difference here? And the friendly guy at the help desk, you know, who's trying to fix your stuff. Okay. Um, lesson number one, just because you can do it doesn't make it, a, doesn't make it legal. Um, the, think of usual business practices for defending your stuff or doing research. Um, it's fairly normal to go and rifle through, you know, huh, something's, something's acting wacky on my network. Uh, one user is doing something odd. I should go and basically poke around their system to figure out who they are and if they're up to no good or if they're just being, you know, weird or clumsy. Um, and I give an example of a recent case out of um, North Dakota. Um, this guy, David Ritz, um, is kind of a pain in the ass, but he, um, he basically suspects Sierra of, of doing something wrong. I'm not sure what, because I've only read the court documents. He never actually says what he's doing. But he basically gets, uh, does his own transfer on Sierra's DNS servers. What are all the machines you've got? OK. Um, and, and from an IT point of view, if you didn't want to give up that information, you wouldn't, allow, you, you wouldn't allow the DNS server to give you his own transfer, right? You know, like, it, it's sort of like, if you didn't want me in this room, you should have locked the door. Um, Unfortunately, uh, Sierra seems to have a better lawyer than Ritz does, and they successfully argue, um, we didn't grant you permission. We didn't grant you permission to go run host-l on our system. And um, you have obtained important data about our company. Now he's on the hook for, and now it's only civil charges, it's not criminal charges, but he, if, if the DA had the same thought, would have been, sorry, that's five years, up to five years in prison for computer hacking, for doing something that, it, it, it's one line, it's not elite. Um, and I give the analogy to some people that, you know, downstairs there's this place where they have all this stuff um, that's useful, like, you know, beverages and snacks and whatnot, and I can just take it and walk out, it's a convenience store. Um, just because you can take it and walk out doesn't mean it's not illegal. Okay, where is this going? Possible does not equal legal. Um, also, when you ha with these nice, vague, gooey laws, a prosecutor who's got a bone to pick can make them hurt people. Now, a lot of times we want, you know, there's this old rule in the law called hard cases make bad law. Someone is bad. We want to punish them. We want to find some way of making them pay. Um, Lori Drew, great example. Lori Drew is something of a shitbag. You know, we've all heard of her because it's the Megan Meyer MySpace suicide case. You know, adults should not do that to teenagers. But she's been charged with, among other things, two counts of uh, unauthorized access to MySpace's servers because she went in, created a username, and used, used the login to get information about Megan Meyer. Um, Normally, that would, in the old days, you know, prior to this year, that would have been at most a contract violation. If MySpace had a desire to actually sue her for whatever, it would have been in civil charges. Now, it's up to five years in prison for something that normally we thought was just normal griefing. Um, and the other, in other scary cases, uh, Citroen, which allows retroactive um, unauthorized access. You have been given, he, he basically deleted files on his work laptop while he worked for a company. And they retroactively charged him because at the time he was planning to leave the company. Even though he still was an employee, had, employee, you know, had a, a company laptop and deleted files on it, the IAC went after him, not for breach of contract, not for unfair competition, but for a violation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, if a prosecutor was convinced, he would be looking at up to 10 years. 
in prison for deleting files on his work laptop. Presumably, you're authorized to do that, you know? You don't want to have to ask your boss, boss, um, I have all, this, um, all these image files that I downloaded for personal use. Can I delete them? You know? Okay, so permission is now getting fluid. People are using it uh, in a weird, weird way. Okay, where am I going with this? Don't be unlikable. And unfortunately, most of the people in this room, most of the people who are interested in, in security, most of the people who are interested in hacking are not particularly likable from mainstream. We look funny, we talk funny, we're interested in funny things. And it's unsafe to be outside of the mainstream with these very, very broad, very vague laws. Okay, now this is a chunk of um, something that every time you use Yahoo, you agree to. If you violate any of this, it's now criminal. So you've all read the terms of service of every web page you've ever gone to, right? And you understood it. Just to say that there's dangerous stuff out there. Okay, is that enough FUD? Okay, there are four basic laws that affect botnet researchers and botnet defenders. Um, the Wiretap Act, which prevents you from uh, intercepting uh, electronic, among other communications, while in transmission. You, um, and it, it mostly, pro it explicitly protects the contents of the communication. Stuff like headers, metadata about it is safe. That's a different law. That's much, it gives a lot more deference to people who are, who are sniffing packets. Um, there's a broad prohibition against interception, except uh, for a couple exceptions we'll get into in a second. Um, the contemporaneous is important. Um, pulling stuff off of disk is not interception. Pulling stuff off the wire is. Um, it does two things. It criminalizes the interception and it criminalizes the disclosure if you know that it was illegally intercepted. Now, there are a couple exceptions which many of you will fall into, hopefully. Um, valid wiretap warrant are, well, I put FISA in there. Um, I really don't want to get asked about FISA because all I do is start screaming profanities. And while that might be an interesting part of performance art, it's not really helpful. Um, more importantly though, prior permission of a party to the communication. Under federal law, any one party to a communication can say, yes, you can intercept my data. Yes, you can intercept. You can wiretap, you can listen to my conversation if I allow it. Some states require all parties to approve. But under federal law, all you have to do is have one. Um, you can also use it to identify a source of electronic interference. The way this is written, it looks like radio interference, but it doesn't say that. So it's a potential defense if you are somehow arguing that a, uh, um, say, a denial of service attack against you. Well, that's electronic. It's interfering with my stuff. I'm allowed to find, I'm allowed to sniff those packets to determine where's it coming from. And provider. Um, provider is very, it's very broadly written. If you are offering a service either to other people or, well, to other people, either employees or customers, you are providing an electronic communication service. Doesn't say ISP, but it clearly includes ISPs. If you run a corporate LAN, you run an educational LAN, you are clearly a provider under the Wiretap Act, and you are allowed to sniff packets to your heart's content provided it's necessary to render service, or you're using it to protect the rights or property of the provider. Um, it's also allowed for fraud against a phone company. Not using the phone company. If A is using the, you know, is using the tel uh, telco to defraud B, the, the telephone company, C, cannot sniff the packets for that purpose. If they're using it to defraud the phone company, they are allowed to sniff the packets. Um, there are exceptions to the prohibition on distribution. Once you've pulled packets, to actually give the, um, to actually give the contents of that transmission to another party, um, you are barred unless you either did not know it was obtained illegally or um, you have permission of one of the parties involved. Now, this is the explicit contents of the communication, not metadata. If you are, say you're doing research on botnets and you say, um, you know, here are the types of packets we get, here are the amounts, here are the characteristics. 
if you're not giving specific information about them, you're safe. Like an actual, you know, the content of. Um, trap and trace. This allows the, con the capture of metadata. Um, where it's going, where it came from, time, size. Um, it has also been used to gather from, to, and subject lines on emails. It's still fluid. We haven't yet figured out everything it covers. So if it's about the communication, it likely falls under trap and trace, which allows basically uh, testing, maintenance, billing. You have a much greater protection under the provider. Um, the provider example. You as a recipient may also just accept, like, I'm allowed to broadcast this information. I'm allowed to capture it. One last important law, Stored Communications Act. This is for pulling data from disk. Um, or actually any storage, no matter how temporary. This has been used to um, define data, say for example, a packet while it's resonant in the memory of a router is in storage, no matter how incidental. As long as it's not on the wire. Now I, I've read one case where they talked about pulling data off of a router, but it's completely, you know, it, I, I wouldn't guarantee that that's a safe place to safe place to sniff that packets unless you have something else to protect you. <clears throat> but it's still a protection there. Um, the provider ex protection under the Stored Communications Act is very, very broad. You're allowed, if you hold the data, if the data's on your system, you're allowed to read it for any reason. So unless there's some other guarantee of privacy, um, your mail server, whoever owns it, can read your email. Um, there's maybe a slight wrinkle in some states that don't permit this, but under federal law, you're generally protected. And the fun one, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. This has not been really used in a couple of years. It hasn't changed in a couple of years until very, very recently where people realize, or prosecutors are realizing it's nicely, broadly written, so you can, get, you can kind of figure out all sorts of neat attacks against people you don't like. Um, makes the following unauthorized access illegal. If you obtain, if you either unauthorized, you know, without authorization access another system and obtain financial, medical, federal interest, namely state secrets, atomic energy stuff, or financial information, that's a violation, up to 10 years in prison. Um, if you have a fraudulent intent with your, with your access, and it causes $5,000 in damage. And that $5,000 can be calculated as, it cost us $5,000 to clean it up. We had to hire a forensics guy. And when he answered the phone, he billed us five grand um, to find out what happened. That's, that ca gets calculated in. So it's really, really easy to hit five grand. Um, recklessly causing damage without permission. So you don't even have to have the intent, but if you say, for example, write a, oh, a uh, worm that travels across the internet and your name is Robert Morris, that was the first use of, of 18 U.S.C. 1030. So if you recklessly cause damage by you know, committing an act on the internet, by transmitting information, um, you can get caught up under this. Okay. We have state laws that affect this stuff. Um, if you're in an individual state, you get affected by the state laws as well. They often mirror federal laws because uh, basically legislators are lazy. Um, they've already written at the federal level. Why should we rewrite it? We'll just crib. Um, wiretap law is the one big exception. Some states ha are what, they, what we like to call two-party states, or all parties involved in a communication have to, give, have to give permission. And the other thing that will affect, I, I foresee seeing uh, affecting botnet researchers is common law torts. Uh, nuisance, which is um, if, I, if I operate my property in such a way that it affects your property, you can sue me for the damages I've caused. Um, slander and libel. If I say a negative, untrue fact about you to other people, either in print, libel, spoken, slander, I am liable for your losses. And some states still allow a privacy tort named intrusion into seclusion. If I broadcast true but private facts about you, I may be liable for your emotional losses. Where do these come into play against a botnet researcher or mitigator? 
Okay. Um, capture. You want to start with